Okay. Thank you very much, Bill. I uh, really appreciate you highlighting these issues that we all need to be aware of and our responsibilities in making sure that this process goes as smoothly as possible. Our next two speakers are both bring with them many years of experience in the aviation-related area, and they will be speaking to us about how animals move through the air cargo system. Our first speaker is Greg Pittlecow from Covance, and he'll be followed by Carl Cole of Cole Consulting. Greg? Okay, is there a clicker? This screen? Oh, that's good. Good morning, all. Good morning. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Institute for Laboratory Animal Research for inviting me to be with you today to speak about one of the most important aspects of moving laboratory animals, and that is the air transport uh, uh, mode. So the skies are busy. In 2013, worldwide air, airline fleets were over 20,000 aircraft. The vast majority of them are single aisle planes, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more in just a moment. Relatively small number are like 747s and uh, an aircraft of that type. And the skies are going to get busier. <laughs> Boeing uh, anticipates that by 2033, in other words 20 years from now, the airline, world's airline fleet is going to more than double. And the majority of that growth is going to be in uh, me small to medium uh, size wide body aircraft and then the single aisle aircraft. The other growth uh, in l uh, very large airplanes is going to be expected to be really very small. And regional jet growth is going to be flat. So let's talk about the regional jets, or as they are disparagingly called Barbie's fun jets. These are small planes with very small cargo compartments. The carriage of animals in these aircraft is extremely limited and very often it's not even possible. Now, in 2013, like I said, there were 2,600 of these planes. And 20 years from now, there's still gonna be around 2,600 of them. The good news is that the industry is dropping the CRJ-200, the smallest aircraft there, faster than they dropped free bags and hot meals. These planes are at $3 a gallon for fuel in a, only a 50 seat capacity. These planes are extremely expensive to operate, which is why airlines are dropping them. But they're moving on to is larger regional jets, like the ERJ-175 that seat anywhere from you know, 70 to 100 people. But again, your cargo capacity on those aircraft is gonna be very small as well. And then we move up to the single aisle jets. Now, these two airplanes, the Boeing 737 and the Airbus A320 and their family of, of aircraft, these are really the workhorses of the world's <laughs> airline fleets. Both of these planes have over 10,000 uh, aircraft either delivered or on order. So they are really the plane that, uh, that's pretty much serving the world airline fleets. Now most of these aircraft can accept small shipments of animals, but under, only under very certain limited, limited conditions. Then we go up to the small and medium sized twin jets. This is really the future of long haul international air travel. It's not gonna be the 747, it's not gonna be the Airbus A380. It's going to be aircraft around this size, seating anywhere from low 200s to about 300 people. Uh, the big players in there would be the Airbus A330 and, and the new Boeing 787 aircraft. Again, they can accept small to medium sized shipments of animals, but under the same limited restrictions that you're gonna have under the smaller aircraft that are flying domestically. 
The large twin aisle jets, a bigger plane does not necessarily mean more capacity for animal shipments. These aircraft, again, can accept, generally accept small to medium sized shipments, but as the same restriction with all the other aircraft, only under very limited uh, conditions. And I think at this point, I'll interject, you're probably wondering what those limited conditions are. Available airspace, uh, total airspace on the aircraft uh, once baggage has been put into the cargo hold, which then diminishes airspace. Uh, heating, uh, and, and uh, when I say heating, you, you have to understand that uh, in an aircraft hold, there is a certain amount of heat. Uh, not so much different than the uh, thermostat that you have in your house. And uh, it's, it's set in the, in, the, uh, in the cockpit of the aircraft. Uh, and it's set to make sure that we don't have uh, your shaving cream explode uh, because it's gotten too cold. It's not set for animals. And in most of the narrow bodies that Greg is talking about, it is a fixed airspace. And interestingly enough, when we say fixed airspace, that means we have to calculate CO2 saturation by animal species. So uh, interestingly enough, one large 100-pound dog will take up less or will generate less uh, CO2 than 10 10-pound puppies. So those are all considerations that we have to take into. So one of the issues that we're dealing with with animal transport. Thank you, Carl. So how does this affect lab animal transport? In the future, you're going to have more planes carrying more people on more flights. The emphasis has been and will continue to be on transporting people. There will be improvements in efficiency and productivity, and these improvements are, going to, are the factors that will drive airplane development and the airline purchasing process. It's not necessarily about passenger comfort. It's not about carrying animals. It's about burning less fuel and flying an aircraft more efficiently. Anything, and I mean anything, that complicates the main task of carrying people, like carrying animals, pets, laboratory animals, will require a very thorough cost versus benefit analysis. And this is what you're all running into with airlines that are refusing to take animals. They are going through this cost benefit analysis and they're finding out that it doesn't make sense to them to do so. So take a few moments to talk about the cargo compartments. As I mentioned earlier, on the regional jets, these compartments are extremely small. Uh, on the little CRJs, it's really just right behind the passenger cabin. There's a small compartment there. That compartment, on a full passenger load, can't even usually carry all of the bags, let alone carrying lab animals or mail or anything else that may be uh, on that plane. They quite often leave lu uh, luggage behind. On the bigger ones, they will have a little cargo compartment underneath the passenger cabin floor. But as you can see in this photo, that's not a big compartment. And again, you fill that up with bags, there isn't a lot of room for anything else. Now on the single aisle jets, they have two cargo compartments. One in front of the wing called the forward compartment and one behind, in behind the wing, oh there it is, the forward and then behind the wing being the aft compartment. Depending on the aircraft, animals may be carried in one or the other compartment. In some cases, they may not be able to be carried in either of the compartments. Now again, these compartments are very small. You can see the, the agent there can barely enough room to, uh, uh, to kneel down to, to stack the luggage. As you can see, everything is loosely stacked. If you're carrying animals, they're going to be loosely stacked in there as well. They're going to be secured from moving around basically by other luggage. Now, when you get to the larger planes, they're going to generally have three, go three different cargo compartments. 
They will have the same forward compartment. Oop, other way around, sorry. They'll have another one towards the back, behind the wing. And then they're going to have a third compartment, the bulk compartment. The bulk compartment is where the majority of animals are normally carried on these larger aircraft. Now these aircraft, the forward and the aft compartment, the two big compartments, those compartments are designed to carry either containerized or palletized cargo. Those cargo bins, as you can see in the picture here on the lower right, there's rollers there, there's uh, locks, there's not really necessarily a flat f floor. Um, so you're going to have an animal load, in this case it's a bunch of rabbits on a pallet, and you can see how the, uh, they're sitting on the basically what's an aluminum cookie sheet, and that would be rolled onto the aircraft and stowed in the cargo compartment. Now, depending on the airline, you know, I already mentioned your animals are not going to be alone. They're going to have uh, bags, they'll have mail, they'll have other cargo, they could even have other animals. But some airlines even have a crew rest area in the cargo compartment. This is a lower deck crew rest module that Northwest Airlines used to use on their Airbus A330s. There's a, uh, a door and a ladder that goes from the pass passenger cabin down to the to the crew rest area, and there's eight bunk beds inside there where the crew would uh, rest on long flights. So, as we often would say at Northwest Airlines, if the cargo compartment is good enough for your animals, it's good enough for our flight attendants. <laughs> now, the bulk compartment, again, this is the, the very last compartment, the very tail of the aircraft. Now, on the big planes, it is somewhat fairly large. You can almost stand in it. There's a, a giant dog crate, but again, you still have a very limited amount of space that's available in this compartment. Now, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the cargo compartments not being pressurized, or there's no uh, oxygen available in them and, and what have you. The cargo compartments on all jet aircraft are pressurized. The only areas that are not pressurized on board the plane would be the radome, where the radar is, the landing gear bays, both the forward nose gear and the main gear, and then of course the tail cone area. Otherwise, the entire fuselage, both on the passenger cabin and in the lower deck cargo holds, is pressurized. These cargo compartments, as, as Carl mentioned earlier, are minim minimally heated to about 40 degrees, give or take, to prevent freezing of luggage and cargo. This heat is normally supplied by warm air from the electronics bay or in some cases from the passenger cabin that is blown into the compartment or around the compartment as the case may be and then it's basically radiant heating from that air that, that warms the, uh, the cargo compartment itself. Air conditioning and ventilation systems vary greatly by airplane model and individual airline requirements. These systems range from not being available at all, like on the Boeing 737 family, to elaborate systems capable of maintaining specific temperatures in flight. You most often find those on the very large aircraft. So the animal <coughs> compartment heating system, it, it's really very typical. What you take, uh, oops, I'm sorry. You, you take cabin air. There's a thermostat that controls the heating, and there's some kind of heating element, whether it be electric heating element or uh, bleed air from the engines. And then this air is either circulated around the compartment or in some cases blown into the compartment. Then there's a fan that ex takes this air and pulls it out of the aircraft, and then it is dumped overboard. So there is no specific temperature control within these compartments. These heating systems are either on, which will maintain a temperature around 65 degrees, give or take, or off, in which case it's lowered to around 45 degrees. Now, when the system is on, it doesn't necessarily maintain 65. Quite often, the heat will not come on until the temperature drops to around 50, maybe even lower. 
And sometimes the heat will not turn off until it gets well above 70. But the average steady state temperature is right around 65, give or take, when these systems are, actu are uh, uh, actually operating. Now, it's the, co the process is a bit more complex when you have an optional ventilation and air conditioning system. Again, you're taking cabin air from the passenger cabin. You're mixing it with hot air from the engines. Then you can go through some isolation valves because whenever you're putting air into a, into a cargo hold, you have to have a means of shutting that air off in the event that there's a fire in the cargo hold. So you have these isolation valves that do that for you. Then they also take air, cold air, from the air conditioning packs on the aircraft, and they mix that all together and they blow it into the forward cargo compartment, or the aft cargo department, depending on the aircraft. From there, it goes through another isolation valve, and a fan pulls it out of the compartment and then dumps the air overboard. So you do have some ventilation and air conditioning systems only on certain aircraft, but this does give you is some variable temperature control. And again, this is really going to vary from one manuf aircraft manufacturer to another. Uh, in some cases, they are capable of setting a very specific temperature. In others, it's going to be a range. These systems are operated by the aircraft engines themselves. So power is usually not supplied to these systems when the engines are not running. In other words, when the plane's on the ground. During those times, the animals are going to be exposed to the ambient air temperatures during loading and unloading. Now that could be sub-zero. It could be over 100 degrees. It all depends on where the aircraft is. But for all that, for all that's been said about the ven ventilation and air conditioning systems, they're not necessary in all cases in order to transport animals. What these systems allow you to do is carry more animals in the given amount of space than would otherwise be possible. Like on an A320, without the <coughs> ventilation and air conditioning system, you can still take animals, but maybe a small load of around 12 to 15. With the ventilated system and the air conditioning, you can boost it up to 40. So it allows you to carry more animals because you're able to exhaust the CO2 buildup. You're able to maintain a temperature. Now, Boeing, uh, Airbus, Canada Air, Embraer, they all publish very technical manuals for the carriage of animals on their aircraft in both ventilated and unventilated compartments. And careful planning and the strict adherence of those rules and guidelines is really essential to protecting animal welfare. Greg, I just might want to interject, too. Uh, when you order airplanes, you have the option, just like you do on your automobile, as to what features that you want on your, your airplane. And if you're not in the animal business, you're not going to be paying for positive ventilation, where there's actually forced air in, into the cargo compartment. Uh, with the number of 10,000 that you mentioned uh, earlier, Greg, uh, I would guarantee at about $100,000 per compartment when it gets down to do I buy this engine or do I buy that engine, unless you are in the animal business and that's a specific uh, a business strategy that you're following, you're not going to do that and you're going to be stuck with, as Greg just mentioned, a basically a fixed airspace where you have CO2 saturation issues. And I, I need to just say this, Greg, uh, the charts for those the saturation uh, were developed by the United States Department of Agriculture about 1965 and 66, and all they have done is extrapolate uh, those numbers over a period of years as the size of the aircraft changed. So very little research done in that area. Yeah. Thanks. So as, as Carl mentioned, why aren't these systems installed on all the planes? For one thing, they're very expensive to buy, anywhere from 100,000 to 500,000 per aircraft. Back in 2003, when I was at Northwest, I was on the entry into service team for the Airbus A330, and later on the Boeing 787. And my responsibility was the cargo compartment systems. 
And back then, in, in the early 2000s, uh, ventilation and air conditioning on the A330 was $285,000 per aircraft. And that has since gone up significantly. These systems are heavy. They weigh anywhere from 500 to 1,000 pounds, some cases even more. And that weight is carried for the life of the aircraft on every single flight, whether or not there are any animals on board the plane. The cost to carry one pound on an aircraft for one year is right around today's fuel prices. We're talking 18 to $20, maybe even more. And that number is variable. So if you're looking at 1,000 pounds for heating and air conditioning system, just to haul it around, you're going to spend around $20,000 a year. Now these systems lower the overall available cargo payload weight that's available. And when you add weight to an aircraft, you lessen the aircraft's range. They require additional maintenance. These are not simple systems. So when you add that all together, as Carl mentioned, it's very difficult to financially justify the revenue from animal carriage versus the cost of install, purchasing, installing, and maintaining and flying these systems for the average lifetime of an aircraft, which is 25 to 30 years. Another question that comes up is, can small lab animals travel in the cabin? No. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because not everyone wants to fly with a menagerie. Few airlines will accept animals in the cabin, and that number is getting less and less as time goes on. <clears throat> One of the big reasons is concerns over real or perceived allergies the escapes and potential for aircraft damage. We had animal escapes on board at Northwest. I, Carl, I know you've had them at United, Americans had them. Everyone who's in the uh, animal transportation business has had animal escapes and aircraft damage incidences caused by these animals. Regulations. A lot of countries do not allow animals in the cabin, so you have to deal with that issue. Those that do permit animals in the cabin really restrict that to dogs, cats, and sometimes birds. This is really designed as a passenger service for their pets. It's not designed as an alternative to carry lab animals on the plane. I'll tell you, uh, in, in my experience, and I'm sure, Carl, you've had something similar in that for everyone who wants to bring an animal on board, there's at least somebody on that plane who doesn't want to see it, smell it, hear it, or have anything to do with it. So the airlines are trying to do a very delicate balancing game between balancing the needs of people who want to bring Fluffy or Snowball on board the aircraft with them and people who, frankly, don't like animals for whatever reason it may be. That's one reason why airlines charge what they do for carry-on pets. If you think they're trying to discourage the practice, right on. <laughs> So let's move on to airport facilities. These standards do vary a lot. What is the norm is you're going to find, especially in the United States, you're going to find a cargo warehouse, and you're going to find a little corner in the warehouse that's going to be their live animal storage area. Now, it's not a separate room. It's co-mingled with everything and its uncle. It's indoors. That's about it. Right. <laughs> In some other places uh, uh, overseas, quite often they don't even have the warehouse. Quite often it's just outside. Very few airlines have invested significant resources in animal transportation. Domestically, United uh, picked up Continental Airlines' Pet Safe program, and Delta Airlines has what they call a Pet First program. These programs, again, are really designed for pet travel. They are not designed for lab animal travel. They're not designed for any other animal travel. Internationally, 
the game's a little bit different. Uh, both Lufthansa and KLM have very extensive animal transportation programs. But again, these programs are really designed for horses, cattle, zoo animals, pets, day-old chicks. KLM does not take research animals. They have one of the best facilities in all of Europe. They have veterinarians on staff at their facilities. They do an absolutely fantastic job handling animals, but they will not take research animals. Lufthansa is just as good, but Lufthansa will only take very limited number of research animals, mainly mice, sometimes rabbits. The other thing you need to keep in mind is that cargo facilities are generally located quite a ways away from the passenger terminal. This is a diagram of Los Angeles International Airport. Now on the south side of the airport is where most of the cargo facilities are. Over here is where the planes are. Now you cannot drive across two active runways to get over to where the planes are. Plus there's a speed limit on the airport grounds of 15 miles an hour. So you have to go around, down two miles of runway, cut over, and then backtrack about another mile to get to some of these terminals. That takes a lot of time. And that is why you're going to have airlines who have a mandatory 45 minute window when temperatures are either too hot or too cold to move animals on the ramp, where they're going to say, we can't do that within 45 minutes. We cannot guarantee that we'll do it in 45 minutes, which means we're just not going to take them. So in summary, more people, more flights, more planes. You're going to see more consolidation in the airline industry, especially outside of the United States. Europe still has way too many airlines. Asia has too many airlines. Animal transportation will continue to be subject to the economic realities affecting every airline. These realities will in turn affect service options, aircraft purchasing decisions, everything that the airline does. The glory days of the golden age of jet travel are over. This is a commodity business and it's driven purely by economic factors. There is limited potential market for live animal transport means that most airlines will con continue to view animal transport as a very small sideline business not worthy of significant investment in, in equipment and staff. And I know Carl you're going to be talking about that at length tomorrow. It's a great presentation. I encourage you all to, uh, to listen to that because it's really going to summarize the airline's perspective on animal transportation and the reasons why they do or do not get in, involved in it. And I think some of the reasons are going to surprise you. They're not necessarily what you th may think they are. Okay. Thank you for your time. I'll take my seat. Where's the clip? Um, right here. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. With that teaser for tomorrow, uh, I hope you will uh, plan on uh, staying around. Is this a touch screen or, there we go, there we go, terrific. I'm going to talk a little bit about training, but uh, I think uh, from Greg's presentation you uh, sensed a not a lot of optimism, and quite frankly there isn't. Uh, I talked to this group in 2008, and uh, at that point in time I kind of felt like I was the canary in the mind, uh, in the mind trying to, uh, to forewarn what was happening. Uh, and I'm just going to, before we go into training, just summarize a little bit of what Greg said. Uh, we are in a situation where, where we are shrinking aircraft fleets. We are sh shrinking our cost of doing business. And in that, those who ship animals uh, are having really difficult times of moving their product. 
Uh, there are there are priorities uh, that that the airlines look look at. And quite honestly, it's easier for me to charge for shipping 10 pounds of gold than it is to be shipping 10 pounds of animals. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the training that uh, that goes into um, uh, into the equation, and I'm going to talk about it domestically, and I'm also going to talk about it uh, fr from an international perspective. Uh, I it would suffice to mention also that we have had a consolidation in the industry. Uh, I'm sure, and I don't need a show of hands, but how many of you attempt to book reservations, and you find it's becoming more and more difficult? That is because the fleet size is shrinking. Greg talked to that with smaller aircraft. Uh, if you're trying to get to other than large major airline hubs, it's becoming more difficult because you are seeing smaller airplanes where we used to have uh, an airplane that would handle 140 people. Now you're looking at maybe an airplane that's got half of that capacity. And of course, with that shrinks the cargo compartment. So if you have a laboratory in Albany, New York, or in Visalia, California, you may find it's very, very difficult to even get anything into, into those airports. So with that being said, uh, it's, not a, it's not a real, real nice, pretty picture. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit now with uh, regulatory requirements. And they, they, they vary. Uh, they vary by, by country and economic region. And there's a wide variance uh, uh, between um, uh, different countries in the world. Uh, and uh, it's important, especially when you're shipping, that, is that you have somebody that's qualified uh, to understand what the shipping process is, what the rules and regulations are. And when we were, I heard the uh, earlier presentation about having somebody specifically dedicated to that job, import, export, because it takes somebody with that knowledge to be able to uh, uh, make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Uh, each country, of course, is going to have a different training protocol and requirements. And training can be very general or very specific. And I mentioned the EU here. Uh, European Union, uh, and, and Robert uh, Quest here will talk a little bit about that uh, after, uh, after uh, my presentation, but uh, they have, for sp particular species, you need to be trained in that specific species if you're going to handle it. So if you're shipping horses, we have to have somebody that is specifically dedicated, that, that knows all the characteristics of shipping horses, uh, the physiology, everything else. So very, very detailed. Uh, when you talk to the United States, uh, it's very general in nature, and it's very scattered. It's U.S. Fish and Wildlife, it's APHIS, uh, it's uh, Homeland Security. Everybody has got their little piece. And quite honestly, I don't need to tell you this, excuse me there, they don't all talk to each other. So sometimes we have, uh, we have unintended consequences, as Bill, uh, Bill White had mentioned. Uh, one regulation uh, then uh, all of a sudden precludes something uh, or conflicts with another. And so the airline just says, you know, hey, I don't need this. I really don't. Now, a majority of, of our world nations uh, have general requirements which apply to all species. Many have no minimum training requirements for shippers, acceptance and handling personnel. So they say, just make sure you're trained. And for those of you that know Title IX, if you go in to the, uh, the USDA regulations, APHIS regulations, Animal Care, Title IX basically says all of these wonderful things about you can't do this, you can't do that, uh, the temperature should be this, the temperature should be that. In my last reading, it does not tell you about a training program or what should be in that training program. Well, obviously, you have to communicate that to your employees so that you're in compliance with the regulations. So they pretty much leave it wide open because obviously you have multiple species you may handle. 
and so one size does not fit all, and that often becomes, a, becomes an issue. Uh, liability for training becomes an issue when the carrier outsources to a third-party handler. For those of, I don't know how many of you flew in uh, if, uh, into Washington here, but if you did, you'll see people running around with little jackets. One of them will say serve air on the back, even though they're there at the United Airlines counter. You do not have, the people behind those counters are not United Airline employees, they're third party handlers. And you may ask, well, why is that? It costs less to hire. My, li my liability of, of, in terms of dollars and cents, uh, it's, a, it just, it's a business decision I've made. And that, that continues to happen. So you have less and less airline employees, you have more and more third party handlers. Now, training liability is always an issue with the, with the enforcement action. So, regulator looks at us as an airline and says, is it the airline's responsibility to make sure that the third party handler is trained, uh, or is it the third party handler? So, we get into that conflict. Uh, they will always, at least in the United States, come after the carrier. However, you are seeing the same issue all over the world, and regulators don't always look at it the same way. So as you can see, it's, it's rather a, kind of a mess. The cost of training, it's expensive. If you're in a unionized shop, typical, a couple years ago was $26 per hour. So if you pull somebody out for training, say let's say two hours, Major carrier, they might have 10,000 ground handlers. Those are the people that actually load animals onto the aircraft. And that doesn't include the people in the cargo facility. It doesn't include uh, ac acceptance personnel that'll be accepting your shipment. And then with the outsourcing of, of, uh, uh, to a third party, the quality is often compromised because you've got somebody that you're, you're hiring at minimum wage to fill a role. And then the big issue that we're dealing with now, worldwide, but especially in this country, we have people that not, do not even speak English. And I'm not pro or con in that, I'm just saying that that is a reality. So how would you expect to train them? Multiple languages? And so you look at it in all the service uh, organizations with an airline, Cargo, uh, animal acceptance, or the person that cleans the, uh, the aircraft so that you have a clean cabin that you get into. We, we have issues with they're using the wrong chemical because they can't read what they're supposed to be uh, using. So one of the tactics that the, uh, the airlines have used is, is to train one person who then has responsibility for the other 10 that are reporting to him or her. Uh, that's, that, can, that works sometimes, but then that becomes a real nightmare in terms of scheduling. What happens when, when Joe is off and he's on days off? So it's, you can begin to see the complexities of that. Without exception, the cost of training and being compliant with uh, existing regulatory requirements far exceeds our revenue stream for transportation. That's the sad fact. You saw the numbers Bill uh, showed you earlier. Cargo in general, worldwide, cargo in general worldwide is a small percentage of the bottom line of the airlines. It's every one of you who is sitting in a seat that really is paying. And you're paying, you're paying less to get the seat, but you're paying more to get your bag checked, uh, to ship your dog, uh, if you want food, all, all of the extras. So a huge amount of ancillary revenue is coming that way. Airlines are forced into that situation because they've had to compete in the marketplace with low cost carriers. So as I say, animal, cargo in general, way down the totem pole. The exception will be where you have an all-cargo 
all cargo company. There are those that exist, fewer and fewer. Uh, airlines like Northwest, airlines like United, airlines that like American had cargo fleets, dedicated cargo fleets. They have none today because they couldn't make money. Hauling just general freight as, as opposed to animals. So it's, uh, and when the bean counters get a hold of it, uh, they really will say, you know, I don't know, we have to have facilities uh, that are ventilated and, oh my gosh, ventilation for aircraft, you heard the costs involved in that. Uh, all of this stuff, is it worth it? If you're going to do it right, uh, you're going to have ground equipment It's going to actually hold animals and there are carts that are ventilated that can come plain side so that you can ship in a 100 degree temperature so that the ambient temperature for the animals is much less than the outside temperature. But that, that takes money. It really takes money. And they're not in a position, they being the airlines, to um, s spend the bucks. As I said, you are really, you the passenger, are really the ones that are paying for that transportation underneath. You are cross-subsidizing the cargo piece of it. And what the cargo revenue does for the carrier probably helps offset some of the fuel costs. Uh, dogs, cats, household birds are probably the most common animals accepted as passenger baggage. That is even less and less because carriers do not want all the issues uh, to deal with that. Training's a big one, it's a cost. Now, training curricula for those who are going to train. Web-based uh, uh, general familiarization. We're seeing more and more of that. Uh, for those of you, and I know our, our speaker earlier, we talked, who was in the education area, uh, is probably familiar with this. But the course design is tailored to the lowest common denominator. So you'll have a 20-question test, probably, online in a room with uh, 50 other people. Hey, Joe, what's the answer to number seven? Uh, very, very, com very, very common. Uh, training can be developed in-house. If you have a training organization, not all airlines have those. Uh, so, or you can get it from a third party vendor that will provide something to you. You can customize training to your needs. And I think, I, as the side says, uh, no need to talk about the care and feeding of monkeys if the only thing you do is carry mice. So very, very, very specific training to whatever your need is. Uh, the one thing with, uh, with uh, the training that is done online, it typically, in today's environment, though it's going to get better, I'm sure, uh, it's a one-way communication. And you're talking to a computer. Okay, you've been through uh, all seven chapters now. There'll be a chapter eight will be a test, and you pass or fail. So you don't get an interactive experience. Curricula, as I said, online training is a one size fits all in most cases. Uh, exceptions exist where the carrier may uh, focus on a specific market. So if all you're doing is shipping mice, if all you're doing is shipping uh, canaries, then it'll be specified to that. And uh, training materials and the salient points to be covered are developed around the type of animals carried. So it's, it's very much customized to what, what, um, uh, what the competent authority and your shipper needs. Emergency training. Uh, I know we had an NPRM not so long ago talking about what do we do in worst case scenarios. Uh, I will tell you, minimally of course, they mentioned the need to have a response plan. But it really stops short, at least in my experience, of uh, developing one or, 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 or even how to implement it. Uh, the one thing that I have always uh, talked, uh, when I especially have done any training, I've, I've talked to uh, air carriers, uh, is, is this. If you ha are going to potentially have a problem, well, let's just say it's a live animal escape, talk to your regulator. Talk to the people that deal with that. 
before you have a problem, not after you have a problem, so that you know who to call, when to call, all of those types of issues. So planning, very, very important. Typically when there's a problem, I can tell you the carrier will defer to a shipper or the broker to handle any emergency. Hey, it's yours. Come pick them up. Uh, and then we've had shippers who uh, don't need to leave the animals out there. That may be hard to believe, but if you're talking about ch chicken poults, if you're talking about turkey poults, you're talking, especially in the poultry industry, that stuff is coming down the pipeline, and they don't need those three-day-old poults. Dispose of them however you want. Airlines don't like to get into that business, uh, though we've been faced with that on numerous occasions. Questions to ask. If you're either a shipper or the agent, broker or a third party handler, and it's, it's, you need to have good planning to meet with all the players involved in animal transportation. So communications is, is very important. Meeting before the emergency, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, and who does what? When does that happen? What's our last resort planning? And I can, I can guarantee you, if you have a, if you have a uh, uh, hurricane coming in, uh, and it's bearing down on you like we see in Florida and other places. <coughs> We're interested in human life and protection of, uh, of facilities. The lab animals, pretty low down on the pecking order, sad to say so. I did not do a whole lot of slides. Uh, I'm not, not a big fan of PowerPoints. Uh, but I, um, I would encourage you, because we're going to talk a lot more about this and in greater detail uh, tomorrow at the roundtable, uh, I encourage you to stick around because it will be a great forum with which to discuss a lot of these issues. Thanks for your attention, and um, I think we're about due for a break. All right. Thank you very much, Carl and Greg. Uh, we are due for a break. We're supposed to be back at 10.30, but I'm going to take the liberty of giving you five more minutes and ask you to be back at 10.35, please. Thank you. <laughs>